Ja, uh, som der står i programmet, så skal min, uh, mit foredrag være på, på engelsk, men jeg vil gerne sige, at, um, at jeg er meget glad for, at, uh, at, være, at, at vi fik prisen. Og jeg vil gerne uh, takke uh, Videnskabernes Selskab, uh, L'Oreal og UNESCO for prisen, og også sige, at um, jeg håber, at med vores uh, forskning og vores arbejde, vi kan også sætte fokus på, hvor vigtig viden er i vores samfund. Uh, men jeg, 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 kommer, jeg, jeg voksede op i Lissabon i Portugal, og jeg har været i Danmark i rigtig mange år, faktisk. Men, uh, et par år. <laughs> men det ja. Så so now in English. <laughs> uh, I'm a marine biologist and a geoscientist, so I have a foot on biology and a foot on geology. I've been working with climate and how climate and biosphere interact and how they have changed in, in long-term uh, scales. And those scales are long-term for biologists, but they are relatively short-term for geologists. So I look at the past few thousand years, which is very little for, for the geological time scale. Yeah. I work in, in Greenland. Uh, a lot, uh, and I sit in Copenhagen at the Geological Survey for uh, Denmark and Greenland, GEOS, uh, which is just in front of Statens Museum for Kunst. Yes. And I'm going to uh, talk about this interplay of what we can use or what we can draw from biology and what we can draw from geology to understand marine life in the Arctic and how it's changing today. So you have a picture here of, actually, I, I took this picture on one of my first cruises to Greenland. Uh, this is the, in the Gotthobsfjord, close to Nuuk, the capital. Um, and I just want to show the picture to make sure that uh, you understand that what I study, you can't see. Because <laughs> I, I study uh, the traces of primary producers, which are the organisms that make photosynthesis that are the basis of all uh, food webs. But in the ocean, as opposed to in land, these organisms are mainly uh, unicellular. So they are looking like this, and they move, hopefully, if the video works. Yes, they move. <laughs> so I spent quite a lot of time uh, working with these organisms, both with diatoms, uh, kisilella in Danish, and dinoflagellates. And dinoflagellates are very special because some species are part of what we call the phytoplankton, but some species are really uh, smart and they can both be uh, predators and work as, uh, for, or do photosynthesis depending on uh, what kind of conditions they're living in. But this is the group of organisms I, I work with. And they are actually as important as all uh, plants on land. So uh, they are responsible for about half of all the oxygen that is produced in the planet. If you think about uh, Kisilelia, which are the diatoms here, actually all diatoms in the planet are producing as much oxygen as all rainforests. So these are a very important, although invisible for the naked eye, um, group of organisms. And this is how you look, uh, this is how they look like if you, if you look at them at about 400 times magnification from the human eye. But there is something for such a tiny organism living in the big, the big ocean, it seems uh, like their environment is very unstable, and it is, and it's also very unpredictable. And when I work uh, in the Arctic, we can't stop wondering what, whether they go in the winter. What are they doing when it's dark and they are photosynthetic and they need to do photosynthesis to survive? Then uh, many, actually, organisms, part of the phytoplankton, both diatoms and dinoflagellates, are able to do, and also other groups, are able to do what we call resting stages. So they have an anchor of their life cycle in the sediment, in the seabed. So if you think about the one that was swimming around, it's a dinoflagellate, so cells will be dividing uh, in the water column, columns, swimming happily, uh, and then eventually they will meet 
each other, make uh, a, a planozygote, it's called, so make, make um, um, a cell, and that cell will insist and become something completely different, looking very different in the sediment. For many, many years, geologists were studying these organisms or these fossils, thinking they were fossils of uh, extinct species, and biologists were looking at the water and describing the species they saw. And then when, for the first time, uh, somebody hatched one of these fossils, uh, they thought they were, it was the same feeling as hatching a dinosaur egg. But it became very clear that many species were doing this. And so, until today, uh, when you work with this group of organisms, each single species has two names. So the biology name and the paleontological name, which can be a really com complicated <laughs> or it can be confusing. So they have this very smart um, alternating mode of having an active, short-lived, vulnerable cell, uh, uh, cell stage and then having resting cells that are very long-lived and resistant. And yesterday, uh, um, Professor Minik Rosing was talking about this uh, Tone Rose song, uh, his story, because during my PhD we found out that some of these cells could actually remain alive in the sediment for a, about a hundred years. And then if you just took them out of the sediment and gave them light and nutrients, they would hatch happily and start dividing as if nothing happened. So, yeah. So they are, when they are ending up in the sediment and being basically buried, if there's a lot of sediment coming on top of them, they are actually very useful time capsules. So you can both uh, study them uh, afterwards, you can both germinate them and do experiments in the lab, or you can directly uh, extract their DNA. There's a lot, of, uh, a lot of things you can do with this. This is what I mean by the biological archive, when I talk about biological archives. Yes? But let's, uh, I promised an Arctic uh, talk, so let's think a little bit what's happening to all these primary producers in the Arctic. Well, the Arctic is by default uh, a region where there's only uh, life or photosynthetic life in a very short, relatively short window of the year. But you have, um, in the Arctic, you have both the phytoplankton-like uh, species growing, but you also have sea ice algae. And sea ice algae are living in the ice or right on the underside of the ice, and they don't move. They are sitting there. So they are, they are uh, what is called sympagic, but they are sort of another type of organisms living in the bottom, but their substrate, instead of being the sediment, is the, is the ice. So in the Arctic, you have this complex community of both sea ice algae and species living uh, at the margin of, of the ice. And why are we interested in Arctic sea ice and its uh, productivity? It's for many different re re uh, reasons. I work at the Department of Glaciology and Climate, so I sometimes have to uh, hide a little bit that I'm a biologist, uh, <laughs> because the focus is very much what can we do with this? What, what can we do with these organisms to tell us something about past climate? And, and that, I think, is extremely exciting. Uh, but I also find it very exciting to study the organisms by themselves. So Arctic sea ice is uh, directly um, linked and it's impacting and it's impacted uh, by climate, not only regionally, but also global climate. Uh, the map, uh, the image you see here is of the Northern Hemisphere. This is Greenland here. And all the red is showing us the temperature difference between the last decade and the period before, from the 70s to, to 2000. And you can see what is, has been uh, noted as the Arctic uh, amplification, that the Arctic is warming up much faster than the rest of the planet, about two to three times as fast. And this has to do with the fact that the ice, when it's there, is acting as a lead which prevents uh, the heat from the sun uh, basically penetrating the ocean, so it just bounces back. Uh, another aspect of why Arctic sea ice is so important in global climate is because when the sea ice is forming, all the salt is expelled to the bottom, uh, and the sea ice is basically fresh water if it's very old. 
So you have the combined effect of the salt being formed and going deeper because it's denser, and the fresh water, when it's melting, affecting global circulation patterns. So what we now have with Arctic sea ice melting is a huge amount of fresh water suddenly coming from the Arctic, and it's changing global circulation patterns. Another uh, link that uh, I've been working with um, together with some colleagues uh, that are uh, working with archaeology and, uh, and anthropology as well, is the impact of Arctic sea ice on human societies. And here, by human societies, we mean uh, indigenous um, people living in the Arctic, so both Arctic Canada and Greenland. And there's been a very, very interesting project uh, recently where they wrote a, a beautiful, very thick book, but basically the conclusion was that it was called The Meaning of Ice, and basically, uh, ice means um, home. It has the same meaning as home uh, for these people, for these communities. It has also a very important meaning in terms of traveling. It's their, their highways are on sea ice. Uh, and also, of course, it's uh, where their livelihood is. So sea ice hunting is, is very, very important for these people. I will, I will go back to that. And then, of course, the fact that Arctic sea ice is not only a platform uh, but also an ecosystem in itself, with all these sea ice species living in and on and under uh, the ice. So what is happening um, to Arctic sea ice? I will show um, a, a very, very uh, nice movie that NASA has put together. Um, and if you look at um, the white, you can see here there's a scale which relates to sea ice age. And so the white parts will be old ice what we call multi-year sea ice, so ice that stays in the Arctic for more than one year. And the, the lighter, the grayer colors are ice that melts away in the summer. Uh, and so we'll see a fast movie uh, starting in 2000 to today. And keep an eye on what happens to the white ice, the old ice. So you can see there's every, every uh, summer there's, and every winter, there's an, there's an annual variability or seasonal variability that is very, uh, very marked. But there's a distinct reduction in multi-year ice. Yes. And so what, what climate modelers and researchers are now Modeling is what we call the blue Arctic, so the Arctic with no sea ice in the summer. And when is that going to happen? Someone, someone asked me at the, at the break, uh, is it, when, is it going to, when is the Arctic going to be uh, uh, sea ice free? This is the state of the art. Uh, the black line shows uh, observations. The observation period, we started observing uh, the Arctic sea ice with satellites in the, the end of the 70s. Then with there's some historical data going back. And then the projections are, these are depending on the different scenarios of emissions. This is part of the, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Governmental Panel for Climate Change. So basically, there's a huge uncertainty in when is it going to be uh, uh, See, uh, when, when is the Arctic going to be free uh, from sea ice in the, uh, in the summer? And there's also, so this would be the realm of reconstruction and the realm of projections. And my point here is that we cannot do good projections without understanding the past variability. And this is a, this is a major issue for Arctic uh, sea ice, that we don't have enough knowledge on how it changed during past times. This is what uh, I uh, work with. We look at uh, archives that are, can be both historical or natural archives. So now we consider satellite images to be already an historical archive because we have a few decades of data. Then there are some old ice charts, actually DMI, the Danish Meteorological Institute, kept some of the oldest uh, ice charts that are now being used uh, worldwide. It started in 1899. 
And then there's also uh, whaling ship log books, but this give us, gives us points in time of where the ice might have been at a certain uh, time. What I, what I work mainly with is the natural archives, and specifically with uh, marine sediment cores. And my colleagues who are uh, modelers, they, they often say that we, are, we seem to be a little bit obsessed with mud, and we are. And, <laughs> and that's because you can extract really, really a lot of information from this wonderful mud. So assuming that it's not just mud, but it's mud that is deposited uh, over time and undisturbed in the seafloor, then you can actually date it and make a time series of what happened back uh, in, in the past. So I work both with the living cells that I talked about uh, before, but also with biomarkers that help us to um, reconstruct sea ice and primary productivity, and the microfossils. Uh, and living cells, we can use maximum so far for, for about 100 years, but the biomarkers in the microfossils are extremely stable and they can, they can give us uh, reconstruction um, million, up to millions of years back in time. So for the time periods that I work with, it's, it's really perfect. One very, very, um, very important and recently uh, discovered biomarker is called IP25, which means ice proxy with 25 carbons. Uh, and this is, um, this is a lipid that is only produced in the sea ice by some diatoms. And if you have the same diatoms living somewhere else, they do not produce the lipid. And then when the, when the ice melts, the lipid goes into the sediments and stays there for millions of years. So it's a very robust proxy. And then there's another one who's, which is still in, under development, which is what we call a marginal ice zone uh, proxy. And that's another uh, uh, isoprenoid, another lipid that is produced by species of the genus Rhizosolenia for the diatom experts here, um, or interested people here. Uh, and those, th those two markers can really tell us something about how sea ice conditions are. So let's, uh, let's uh, focus on um, high Arctic Greenland. This, is, um, this, this map shows uh, a simulation done by a colleague at DMI. This was actually done uh, for, before we were uh, writing a proposal. Uh, showing that because, partly because of, of the sea ice, high Arctic Greenland is very, very prone to warming uh, and melting in the future. So this is the difference from uh, the, the era interim period to the end of the century. But this is just to say that this region of high Arctic Greenland is both a very important gateway for sea ice coming out. You remember from the animation, the ice is being flushed th through the Fram Strait and also here. So it's both uh, a very sensitive uh, to warming uh, area, but also very productive in terms of, of these primary producers uh, being there. Um, yesterday, again, Minik talked about uh, polar explorers and how they look like. And I think he was trying to, uh, he was uh, more or less saying that I don't look like a polar explorer. <laughs> And I have to say that being a marine scientist, he's not a marine scientist, he's been doing, he's been camping a lot on, on, on the Greenland, uh, on Greenland, on the ice sheet, that it's true that often we go on research vessels and we call it, I'm going on a cruise, and everyone thinks, oh, come on. But it can be, it can be very, very hard. But I did find pictures from once where we were doing marine science, but on the sea ice, so everything was frozen, to show that uh, it can be very tough. <laughs> this was when we went two years ago to Station North and were uh, drilling through the sea ice to get to the water, to get to the sediments. And this was when we collected our very first uh, sediments that froze 20 minutes later. So it was a, a disaster. It took us about 10 hours to get a sample <laughs> at minus 15, minus 20. And uh, yeah, so this was the closest I could... Uh, uh, a picture I could find. I, I, I promised that I would show a picture looking like a polar explorer. Uh, for, the re for the remaining of my, of my talk, I will focus on one example of work we've been doing on Northwest Greenland, where we did a sea ice and primary productivity reconstruction at the North Water, Polinia, a very important uh, region. And then I will talk a little bit about what I'm going to use the, 
the revealing for. Yeah. So let's go back to the humans. We have been involved at GEOS, we have been involved in a European project called Ice Arc, which has been a truly uh, amazing project because it's been truly interdisciplinary. So geoscientists meet archaeologists, meet modelers, meet anthropologists to look at sea ice changes in the region of the North Water Polynia. And Kanak, uh, for those of you who you know where Kanak is in Northwest Greenland, yeah, so it's, it's the largest northerly settlement in Greenland. People are actively uh, hunting there and living off the resources of the North Water Polynia. But it's also a very important region because it's basically the gateway to Greenland. So Greenland was uh, first, the first people setting foot on Greenland arrived about 4,500 years ago. And there's been um, a succession of cultures from the independence one to the Sakak, and these cultures are, are considered uh, pre-Eskimo cultures, so they, they did not have uh, boats or kayaks or anything like the Tule did. And then the Greenland Dorset have been extremely successful, and then there's a gap where there is absolutely no archaeological evidence that anyone has been living on Greenland. Very strange, it's also been called the mystery period until the late Dorset arrived, but they were mainly only in this region. And in the Norse, they didn't exactly cross uh, from Northwest Greenland, they came from Iceland. And the Tule, who uh, it has been shown also by uh, genetic studies from Esquivilis-Leo's group, that the Tule came and replaced uh, the other cultures, both genetically but also culturally, so they were extremely successful. Yes. So there's this period here to keep in mind. And how did people arrive? Uh, according to uh, what is thought to be true, they crossed the ice bridge that forms between, um, between Ellesmere Island and Greenland. And this ice bridge is actually necessary to form the Polynia. So what is a, what is a Polynia? The North Water is a, the largest Polynia in the Arctic, and it's basically an area that remains uh, free from ice, surrounded by ice, and it remains free from ice because there's winds pushing the ice, uh, the thin ice away as it forms, and there's also warm water from underneath, keeping the, keeping the, the water open. So it's an extremely productive, it's basically an oasis in the middle of a desert. Um, and that's where the animals gather, there's millions and millions of bird colonies and mammals uh, gathering here, and that's where people um, of course, we're also attracted to come to this region. We have, uh, in collaboration with uh, Canadian colleagues that uh, went on the Amundsen, which is a, 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 an icebreaker uh, vessel, collected a, a long sediment core from a, an area that was pinpointed to be representative of the North Water Polynia, where the sediments were deposited exactly as we wanted. And we... Um, uh, we, rec we, we managed to reconstruct about 4,000 years of history of this region. And I, we, were, we were talking about showing as little results as possible because it's all these wiggles, but this one I can't help <laughs> showing. So on the top, uh, the top wiggle is the, the ice core uh, record from Agassiz, from Ellesmere Island. And this is our IP25 showing uh, seasonal sea ice in the region. And this is our uh, HPI3 showing a marginalized zones. So productivity in waters that are full of ice or with icy waters. And this is our diatom uh, concentrations, which are matched with biogenic silica. So they are an indicator of how productive the waters are. And there is... Um, Clearly, so we are in, a, in the context of the, of the Holocene, the past 11,700 years, we have a period of transition from a relatively uh, warmer conditions happening from about 4,000 to 2,200 years ago. And then there's a period of instability, and then there's a cooling, and then there's modern warming, which is unprecedented in terms of, of rate. Yeah. 
This is what's called the late Holocene cooling, and this is what's called the transition from the mid to the late Holocene. So that was a period of instability. And we knew, we knew that from the ice core records, but there were no, no marine records to show what could have happened in, in the marine environment. Uh, and with this record, we could show that this instability was reflected in lower productivity at about 2.2 thousand um, years ago. Now let's look at the cultures in northwest Greenland. So this is a, the data set we have been gathering with our archaeology colleagues. And this we have Independence One arriving a little bit before our record. Then we have the Sakak, the Greenland Dorset, and then we have the Mystery Period. Then we have the Late Dorset, the Norse, and the Tula. So it seems like uh, what we see as um, a reduction in productivity at the Northwater Polynia and a contraction of the Polynia and perhaps failure of the Polynia some years might have actually been reflected in what, what the human history of Greenland is. And this is the, the value of working across disciplines. Um, yeah, it's, I find it very exciting. Um, now uh, to northeast Greenland. So we went on a, on a cruise uh, this year uh, so in September. Uh, it was called the North Green uh, Expedition, and it was, this cruise was the basis for the application to the, to the L'Oreal UNESCO um, grant. Uh, we were, all these cruises are, are really a collaborative effort because it is very expensive to be. Uh, we have to compare prices for your synchrotron and for uh, an Arctic cruise because it's really, it's about 200,000 kroner per day to be on, on the ship. Uh, so we really need to bring together a lot of funding to make sure that we're there. We were 20 scientists, both from geosciences and biosciences, oceanographers, uh, we were uh, 21 days at sea, and we went to places that we did not expect to go. It was only possible because the sea ice was so low. So we went with the Danish research vessel, Dana, which is not an icebreaker, it's an ice-going vessel, and we were a little bit worried uh, where, how far we could go, but we managed to go to up to 80 degrees north, which is, uh, which is pretty... Uh, Pretty amazing. So we were looking very happy here, although we should be sad because the ice is not there. <laughs> the ice is disappearing. But we got, we managed to get some samples from a latitude that we didn't expect was possible without an, an icebreaker. What we are uh, going to do with the with the material and with the with the grant is to explore both sea ice and primary producers here. Again, with the focus on having the the present as a past, as a key to, to explain the past. And we want to uh, explore um, environmental and sedimentary ancient DNA as a possible uh, marker also for sea ice changes uh, in the region. So we have both a uh, comparison of the classical proxies. How are they uh, coming from the ice and the water column? How do they end up in the sediment? Well, how are they selected? Uh, how are they preserved? Uh, so we collected uh, water samples, we collected plankton samples, and we collected sediments. So we're going to do this matching of what's happening from the moment the proxies basically are produced until they reach the bottom of the ocean, and then a component of proxy development where we look at DNA. And we have already started uh, looking at DNA from the 4,000-year-old um, record, and there's very, uh, very exciting results. So there's there's DNA preserved from some of the, of the sea ice indicators uh, down to 4,000 years. So we're very uh, glad to get the opportunity to explore this further. And I also want to um, acknowledge um, my, many of my collaborators. I've, I've mixed in uh, postdoc supervisors, uh, colleagues and field work uh, helpers. And also thank the, the Willem uh, Fund for the Young Investigator uh, Grant, uh, the ISARC project. Uh, and the Dansk Center for How Fosking, which funded our cruise uh, expedition. This was very, very important. Tak. Yeah.